Next we have Jeff Trull. Where are you sitting? There you go. Uh, a former microprocessor design engineer and now a C++ consultant who sometimes misses the days when he needed a microscope to see his work. And uh, this is an intriguing title, Rolling Your Own Circuit Simulator with Eigen and Boost.ode int. So in 15 minutes, a circuit simulator. Sure, we can do that. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so historically, computer-aided design programs had this sort of thick layer of infrastructure in the bottom of them that were things like you know, graph algorithms or uh, linear algebra or numerics or parsers or stuff like that. And um, these are a lot of things that sort of look like general purpose libraries. But back then when these programs were started, which is sometimes a really long time ago, the people involved were, like they tended to be like XC programmers and the, also sometimes even like the standard library wasn't always that reliable and stuff like that. So you got all this stuff that's kind of like internally invented code. But time is, times have changed and there's a lot of good stuff out there um, for doing engineering work. And I think that um, in, the, in the EDA and the CAD world, we need to start thinking about using some of these libraries that are available now so that we can focus, instead of this, this, all of this sort of legacy code that we're maintaining, focus instead on uh, addressing our problem area and, and focusing on our core competency instead. And so I want to give a motivating example, um, which is circuit simulation. So for the purpose of this, of this group, I think we can describe circuits as a type of graph, and graphs have um, nodes are um, where the components of the graph come together and they have voltages, and the edges of the graph are sometimes called branches. They are components, and the components have currents, and the currents are functions of the voltages across the components between the connecting nodes, uh, and uh, they're the value of the component, and sometimes the history that the component has gone through. So here's, a, here's an example. Um, this is the simplest one you can imagine. It's a resistor. The resistor has a current um, between the two nodes, which is proportional to the difference in voltages on the nodes and the value of the resistor. So here's the example circuit I'm going to use. It's got three sort of interesting components. Just disregard the input voltage for now. Um, there's a resistor, then there's a capacitor, and then there's an inductor. And so I'm going to try to simulate what happens when we apply a square wave at the input on the left and what, what should be happening on the output. So here's how you can analyze that with <laughs> differential equations. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit of a struggle to do this for me as well. So if you, if you do like me and go get your differential equations textbook from college, you can work out that um, there's, there's basically two equations that are important here. The first one has the sum of all the currents going into the node number one on the right has to be zero because of charge conservation. The other one represents the branch current on the output inductor. If you solve all of that, take my word for it, um, you come up with a, the output as a function of time with that square wave input looks like that equation on the bottom. So we can, we can go and, and sort of simulate this by simply implementing that equation. Um, we construct a, a circuit which is a function object and you supply the, the time and it returns to you the output value at that time. So that's one way of solving this. And there you can be plotting out the results. Um, and it looks like this. So it just, it just kind of like, you get a square input in and it kind of rings, you know. Um, so there's a problem with this, which is that you don't want people sitting around and like manually solving differential equations to come up with their, their program. Um, it's also not general. There's even some, some kinds of, of circuits where you actually can't manually solve the differential equation. But we can use numeric integration and make this a lot easier um, and handle both of those issues. So the Boost ODE int library came out two years ago. Um, you can use it for numerical integration of, of um, systems of, of differential equations. You just need to supply four things to it. You need the state definition, which is kind of like, if you look at that, that first example I showed, it's like the current and the voltage at the output. Um, you need a callable object, and this actually sort of instantiates your differential equations. It returns for a given 
uh, state vector and time, it returns the change in the state vector. And ODNT is going to repeatedly call this to, de to determine the values at each point. You need the initial conditions, which are just the first values of the state variables. And finally, a callable object, every time ODEINT figures out uh, the value at a time point, it's going to call this thing, and then you can store it away or print it or whatever. So here's how this would look uh, for our example circuit. Um, I'm building here another function object, but this time it's in the form that ODEINT wants to see. Um, we, have this, we have this state vector, which is just two, two values, and the, the um, operator give, it takes the current value of the state variables and the time and returns in that second uh, reference parameter the change in the values. And if you look now, instead of solving the differential equations and having just one thing that's a function of time, I'm actually just reorganized the equations a little bit, and now I can return the change in the state variables as function of time. And this is the way ODE and wants to see it. And so when you're actually going to call this thing, I'm instantiating the circuit. Um, I'm creating the initial conditions. And then this is the main call to, to the integrate function that ODEINT provides. And um, you give it the, that circuit object I created, the initial conditions, the time range, and something to do with the values as it calculates it. So that's still, that's, that's good, it's an, and it's an improvement over what we started with. But we still had to manually rearrange everything, so there's still some sort of human intervention here. What we really want to do is have a, a mechanical way of representing circuits um, in a standard form that we can, can then operate on so that the user can supply any circuit they want and we'll still handle it correctly. The standard way of representing circuits now is something called modified nodal analysis. Um, you'll end up with a set of matrices, um, some of which hold, one of which holds the time-dependent elements and one of which holds everything else. Um, and I'll demonstrate that. So this is kind of what it looks like. Instead of two equations, two differential equations and two variables, we now have four differential equations and four variables. But in return for that increased verbosity, we have a standard format that we can mechanically put information into. So if you look down at the G matrix there, you'll see this little, um, you'll see this, this pattern where there's the one over R's, there's four one over R's there. That's what we call the, the stamp of the resistor component. And you can, you can take, the, the user can supply a, a, any resistor and just simply say, the value of the resistor and the nodes is connected in between. And we have a mechanical way of, of sticking that in the matrix. And when you put this all together, you have a correct differential equation, a system of differential equations that represents the circuit correctly. But now we've created it um, mechanically. So once we've done that, now we can, we can multiply both sides of this equation by the inverse of C. And we get the form that boost ODE and wanted to see. We, we can now calculate that change in the state variables as a function of the time and the current state variable. But to do that, we're going to need a matrix library to represent the, the matrices. Uh, and this, in this case, I chose Eigen. There's, there's several, but um, Eigen had a really active user base and friendly documentation, so I started there. It's also got a lot of other features, including algorithms, which we're going to make use of. Um, so this is an example of the stamp, which is the conventional way of representing a, a component. And I've given the example of the resistor, which I showed you earlier. Um, so this is just a way uh, if you look at the usage here, uh, imagine that we're reading in from the user or some file or something like that, all, all the different resistors and other components, we can simply call this function. As long as we have the matrix of the right size, then we'll end up with, with all of the matrices we need to represent the system. Uh, we have, unfortunately, a little problem here, and some of you who know about math will, will know what it is. We can't actually multiply both sides by the inverse of C here, because C is singular, which means it can't be inverted. Um, this, this is a, uh, it's, singular is a mathematical term, but I kind of think of it as the matrix has too many zeros. It's, it's not very, but um, 
I'm not a mathematician. Um, but we can fix this. And so here's how we're going to fix it. We're going to turn those four equations into two equations and two variables again by, first of all, moving the non-zero elements of C up into the upper left-hand corner with Gaussian elimination, if you guys remember that. Um, <laughs> We're also going to take advantage of the all zero rows of, of C to restate two of the state variables in terms of the other two. So um, this is how the code will look. And Eigen provides all of this stuff for you. It's going to apply Gaussian elimination to C. And it's going to remember all the operations it did. And the result of that is you see C is now L and C are in the upper left-hand corner. And it's also reordered G. And it, it, used the, it applied the same changes to G that it did to C because it remembered them. And so now we have another system of four equations and four variables that's just been reordered. But it's still, it's still effectively the same. So, um, but now we can, we can apply a little bit more algebra and get to something that we can invert. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to eliminate those last two state variables, the, the V0 and the input current, using some algebra. And again, this is more Eigen stuff. We end up with something that looks like that equation down there. And now the C nu is actually a matrix that can be inverted. And once we've done that, then we can end up with that last line there where we can once again calculate the change in the state variables based on their current value in the time, which is what ODE wants. Having done that, we can do our numerical integration, and you get a graph that looks like that, which is very much like the first one, only there's a little bit of numeric integration artifacts. I actually just left that in so you could see it was being done that way. Um, so in conclusion, we now have all these really awesome libraries, um, ODE and Eigen. There's actually a whole bunch of, of matrix and linear algebra libraries out there. And they can do some pretty incredible things for us. And so a lot of this stuff that we used to do kind of like with this sort of you know, proprietary library layer, uh, which has bugs and has to be maintained and all that kind of stuff, you can start to eliminate them. And instead of doing that, um, use an open source library that, that's very powerful and robust and well-maintained and has lots of eyes on it, and even contribute to it. And life will be like super better, I think. So, and there's some resources. Thank you.